Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'd like to first thank the organizers for the invitation and for. So I'm, I'm already here two weeks, and uh, so last week was very good, and this week seems to be very good. So, but I guess you'll be thanked formally in the next hour. It's very nice. Uh, so what I will speak about is um, how should I say, semi-classical. I mean, it's not derived algebraic geometry, but there are derived categories, and hidden somewhere that won't be visible today are, are, are DG rings, so kind of, you know, affine DG schemes, but they're not going to be visible. So um, really it's kind of algebraic geometry that, uh, and if you know stacks, which you, know, you could have known maybe 30 years ago, um, then uh, um, you would be able to enjoy this lecture as much as today, hopefully, yes. Um, so, uh, the idea is, uh, let me outline, so I, I will begin with actually talking about some commutative ring theory, and uh, uh, the, the initial parts, uh, are, this is joint work with the James Young, um, so I'll explain rigid dualizing complexes over rings, and then um, I will talk about very special, nice, very nice kinds of, uh, of such complexes called residue complexes, uh, and then I will show how everything fits on schemes, and, um, and then I will prove, so up to here, numbers one, two, three, four are basically kind of a, a variation on, on what uh, Grothendieck um, had done already in 1966 in residues and duality. Um, so up to this point, we recover most of the results. We do have some kind of a technical caveat that I'll show you. We have to work over a nice base ring, for example, over the integers. Um, but... Um, uh, so somehow to be finite over that in a suitable sense. Um, but um, the benefits uh, in these points is, is, I would like to think of it as a, a much more accessible um, approach than the, the previous uh, approaches to duality. Uh, the last part, number five, is actually um, something which I think is completely new. Uh, so we show how this theory that we, we, um, we worked, um, we, we, we developed, actually uh, without too much difficulty can be uh, propagated from uh, the situation of schemes to the situation of Deline Mumford stacks. Um, and then um, some of the residue theory uh, holds in this situation. So um, um, this is where I'm heading. So as I said, um, the, the, the ring theoretical aspects are, um, is, is joint work with James Zhang. Uh, Zhang and I. Um, usually worked on non-commutative ring theory. And in fact, this concept of rigidity arose, as, as you will see, uh, from the work of Michel Vandenberg in non-commutative algebraic geometry slash non-commutative ring theory. Um, and um, and uh, it turns out to be very interesting. Uh, and in fact, it was rediscovered by several other people. Maybe I'll mention this later uh, um, in, in the commutative world. OK, so um, now um, the lecture notes. Um, if you, so if you go on, on the program, you can click the three red stars and you can get lecture notes of the same thing. Um, and so, um, right, so it should be convenient. Okay, so, uh, so everything is commutative in this talk. Um, and um, as I said, we, we have to work over a, a nice base ring, so over, over a field, over the ring of integers. In general, K could be a, a finite dimensional regular notarian ring. Um, which is essential for our, our, um, our constructions to work. Um, so the, the finiteness condition is, um, so f essentially finite type means that A is gotten from K by adding a few generators and then um, also localizing. So this includes a finite type algebras, but also the local rings and, and the function fields that you will, you will encounter in algebraic geometry. Um, Okay, so, um, so let me use this notation for the category of complexes and this notation for the derived category. Um, and let me just remind you that um, the objects in these two categories are the same. Um, however, this is an abelian, let's say abelian DG category, whereas this is just a derived, just a triangulated category. There's this functor which what it does is, um, well, the effect is that it inverts quasi-isomorphisms. So any map here can be written, of course, in a very non-unique fashion as a fraction where the denominator is a quasi-isomorphism. Okay, so um, since our ring is notarian, it's sensible to talk about the finite part of the derived category, namely uh, complexes, DG modules, complexes. 
uh, that have bounded cohomology and, and everything is finitely generated. Uh, now, the, the, the basis of this construction is, uh, is an operation, a functor that um, uh, Zhang and I constructed um, generalizing from, so the, over a base field, it's actually a rather simple-minded operation, as you will see, um, uh, a, a relative of, of Hochschild cohomology, um, but over a base ring, which is not a field, it turns out to be even more complicated than we thought in the sense that we wrote a paper, and a few years later, it turns out that there are several deep gaps in the proofs, uh, which were basically due to the fact that at the time, so maybe eight years ago, Jean and I were, were somehow naive or uh, un uneducated in the rules of, uh, in the operations of, of DG rings, um, and we thought all kinds of things that need proving, and um, it turns out that one has to work much deeper and um, analyze homotopies between DG rings, uh, and so, um, but, so I'll get to this, I'll say even more about this. This operation is, is quite complicated, but extremely useful. Um, so what, what is this squaring? So it's actually a functor from the derived category to itself, but it's not a linear functor. So this is quite kind of bizarre. It's a functor which is quadratic. And in what sense is it quadratic? So if I have a, a morphism from a complex M to a complex N, uh, and I, I have a, a scalar, so an element of the ring, if I apply the squaring operation to A times phi, I can extract A from the outside, but it comes out A squared. So in this square, sense, it's quadratic. It's kind of unusual. Uh, but this sort of functor is extremely useful, as I will show you. Um, um, so the, the formula, as I said, in case we're working over a base field, or at least if there's flatness, uh, if A is flat over K, then we simply do this operation. We take, um, so you should think of it geometrically as you take a sheaf M or a complex of sheaves M, you pull it back to the product of spec A with itself from the two projections, um, and then you do our home, which is this suitable sort of pullback to the diagonal. So this is what this says. Uh, however, um, uh, the, the secret is that, um, is that this is, is secretly the drive tensor product of, um, of A over K. So if there's no flatness, you must resolve A with a suitable resolution of it. And uh, our, our error, our, our naive um, mistake was we didn't suitably verify what happens when you change resolutions of, the D, uh, of, of A by some A tilde. Um, fortunately, all our mistakes are rectifiable, so our intuition was correct, only our work was sloppy. Um, and um, um, so, um, okay, so I'll, I'll say a bit more about this maybe in, in a second. Uh, so, but this, this is, in, in, at the end of the day, after a lot of work, a, a solid, well-defined operation. And so we get, we get such a functor with this quadratic property. Um, and then having the squaring, everything proceeds smoothly. We can define... Um, uh, the rigidi uh, rigidifying isomorphism as follows. So M is a complex and object in the derived category. This is its square. And a rigidifying isomorphism is a derived category isomorphism between M and its squared. Now, I have to say that this uh, cannot, does not make sense at all outside of the derived category, except in very um, simple-minded situations where, let's say, K is a field and A is a finite algebra over it which is then linear algebra. But anything else, uh, this kind of isomorphism only is sensible in the derived category, uh, which um, is going to have some interesting consequences later. Uh, and now, having uh, this, th this equation in mind, uh, a rigid complex over A, always relative to the base, is a pair consisting of a complex in the finite part of the derived category together with a, su such a rigidifying isomorphism. Um, now, um, we can also talk about a morphism, a rigid morphism between two such rigid complexes. So if N is another such a rigid complex, a rigid morphism consists of, um, as you can imagine, a, a usual morphism in the derived category, which respect the, respects the rigidity in the sense that this diagram of morphisms in the derived category is commutative. Uh, and in this way, we, we get a a category. Uh, now, l let me, um, I, I can demonstrate uh, by hand-waving uh, how, w what is the benefit of this, well, the initial benefit, there's, there's several, remember, the initial benefit of this uh, uh, rigidifying construction, and it explains the name. So, suppose 
M is a rigid complex, M rho, with the property. So what this formula says is that the ring of endomorphins of M in the derived category is precisely A. So A acts on it, and it should be everything. So it's bijecting to it. In this, sort of, and these, uh, in this sort of situation, I claim that the only automorphism of the rigid complex in, in, in the rigid category is the identity. Why is that? Well, I, I can explain using this. So suppose M equals N, and phi is a, a, an isomorphism. So this condition means that phi is really the identity multiplied by some element A, which is a unit of the ring, an invertible element. Now, because of this commutativity, the square of, a, of phi is A times the identity. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, A squared times the identity. And so what we get here is that um, A squared has to equal to A, because he, here it's A times phi, A times the identity, and here's A squared times the identity. So the, the element A has to satisfy, number one, it's invertible, number two, it's an idempotent, A equals A squared, and the only solution to that is A equals one. Um, in fact, that's the rule of the, of the game. Whenever we have such a, a quadratic functor and we have a situation where a group is involved, uh, it, this equation leads us to solving an equation of the form x squared equals x, and in a group this means x equals 1. So this will be solved again and again. Here it's in the group of units of the ring. Uh, it's solved in the ring of integers getting rid of shifts, and it's solved in the uh, Picard, or derived Picard group of the ring getting rid of twists by... Um, by Lund bundles or um, in the non-commutative world by, by tilting complexes. Okay, so, th so this is the reason why we want rigidity. The initial reason is to single out uh, uh, the identity as the only automorphism. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, this concept goes back to Vandenberg in the non-commutative world where, of course, one has to keep track of a lot more information, but miraculously it works. And uh, my work with Jean on this, on this aspect is primarily to get rid of the base field, but also to analyze the functorial properties of this rigidifying, oper this, this rigid operation, which we'll, I'll get to soon. So there are traces and there are etat localizations. Um, so that this is uh, our work. As I said, there are errors in this, uh, mostly um, somehow as a naive, a simple-minded attempt to get rid of, of um, of indeterminacy in the DG algebra resolutions. Uh, this was discovered um, a couple of years later in this paper by Avramov, Iengar, Lipman, and uh, Nayak, and they actually uh, fixed the initial big mistake. Uh, they, they used uh, the Quillen model structure on non-commutative DG rings, but, um, w which one has to do, but there, there are still further uh, facts that needed correction, but we, we, we managed to it set us back a long time, but we finally were able to fix everything. So some of the results were correct, but the proofs were horribly um, riddled with, with uh, gaps. Can I ask, uh, yeah. I, uh, naively, I would have thought one could take the, some sort of uh, uh, two-sided Hochschild complex to represent your square construction. Uh, that would avoid having to select a resolution. Of a no, you... you um, there are several reasons why you want to do it, and primarily, um, I, I mentioned non-commutative DG rings. Uh, and so this is what uh, Avramov, let's say Avramov and friends did, uh, using the Quillen model structure. Uh, our proof does not use the Quillen, we use much less properties, but we still have to pass to the non-commutative resolutions where you have suitable homotopies uh, that you don't have in the commutative. But once we have this independence, we want to stay within the commutative world. So, so but, but no, no. So you're saying the Hochschild complex doesn't work? No, so I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying that we, we have to allow ourselves to, to give all kinds of resolutions suitable later, ad hoc. For now, to, the, to define it, does the Hochschild complex give the answer, give the formula for it? Or well, you, you would, you, I, I don't see exactly how you would fit the Hochschild complex in there. Well, you wrote down Hochschild homology. That was the yeah, yeah, but the, the, issue, the issue is over which, over which, um, no, so here, oh, so here. You take a tensor L over K A. Oh, A is flat over K. No, you don't. You don't want to assume that. Ah, a is not flat. Yeah, this is the whole issue. And you haven't taken L in the tensor product of A with itself. No, so here, yeah. So if if there was here, it's assumed flat. Otherwise, flat. I would have. Okay. No, if it's not flat, for example, if you work of the integers, yes. 
um, then you will have to resolve A. Okay, so that's the issue. It's not, the issue is not how we calculate oh, the R harm, but over which coefficients. I misread. That's not the formula. That's no, no, no. Oh, I no, this is the square in the flat situation. Oh, okay. so, the, the, so you would have to adorn this by some yes. tilde. And, and the tilde, okay, so I should have written this perhaps. The, the tilde is the one that gives the trouble. Okay, so I didn't write the problem. Yeah, yeah, no, so you, you yeah, um, so, 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 right. So th that's the issue. Over which ring do you take the, um, the calculation? Um, maybe it's written somewhere later in this discussion here. It's not. Okay, so that's the issue. Um, it's no longer an issue, but it's difficult. The wonderful thing is, right, the wonderful thing is you don't need the full power of that and you can get, so, but, yeah, you can you somehow use a black box to get something and then forget it. Um, but it's, yeah. Okay, so now once we have this operation at hand, um, okay, it, it, this the squaring has further properties that will be hidden um, in, um, in what I will say now. Um, so now um, I want to talk about to fit duality into this picture. But though you didn't, people didn't ask, you could ask, do there exist any rigid complexes? <laughs> uh, and maybe I'll say something about this because um, it's not written, but um, so the answer is always yes because zero is a rigid complex. Of course, it's, it's completely uninteresting. So uh, l let me say that a rigid complex, remember rigid, so th th this has to be in the finite part with it. Let's n let me call a rigid complex non-degenerate if restricted to every connected component of the spectrum of the ring, it's non-zero. Okay? So, you, so we want to look for a non-degenerate uh, rigid complex, and the answer is th it exists always. It's unique up to unique isomorphism, and it is dualizing. So once I will talk about the rigid dualizing complex of an algebra, any rigid complex which is non-degenerate has to be the dualizing, and then it's uniquely isomorphic to the dual. So, so have some having this, this rigidity that's non-degenerate is an extremely strong condition, and I found it, so we discovered it, Zhang and I, our proof again was not so good. Uh, Avramov and friends fixed it, you know, and got rid of all kinds of assumptions, but it didn't explain the reason, and the reason, well, philosophically or something which will s somehow explicate this is, um, so Geitz Gori, Dennis Geitz Gori in his investigations hit upon the squaring operation. He worked over a field of characteristic zero, so there's no issue of the flatness, but you can do this with two variables, an M here and an N here. So you get, instead of a quadratic functor, a bilinear functor. And he, is his notation for this operation of M and N, he calls it the Schrick tensor product over A. And what he claims, uh, Geitz Gori, I don't think he has the proof, although um, my, my former student found the proof, is that this is actually a, 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 a symmetric monoidal structure on the derived category. Okay, so this, this tensoring of M with an M, and, and what is the unit for this monoidal structure? Well, it is the rigid dualizing complex. So um, it, somehow, uh, since a monoidal unit should be unique up to very strong uniqueness, then this is an explication why any non, so what you need is, yeah, so any non-degenerate uh, rigid guy is a unit and therefore is, is, is unique. So th again, what this means further on, I don't understand, but at least it gives some kind of, a, um, some kind of an explication. Okay, so I'm, I'm going too slow. Um, so, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm in the same setting. Let me remind you Gottendieck's definition of a dualizing uh, complex. So, a dualizing complex is a complex in the finite part. It has to have finite ejective dimension, which means uh, x vanish above uh, a bounded degree. And we want this, uh, this uh, some people call it the semi-dualizing property, that its endomorphisms are exactly multiplications by the ring. Uh, Grotendieck proved that given such a dualizing complex R, uh, home into it in the derived sense is an auto-equivalence of the uh, finite part of the derived category, that's duality. That's why it's called dualizing. And now what we do is, again, following Vandenberg, is we say a rigid dualizing complex is a rigid complex such that the first argument on its own is a dualizing complex. Uh, so I already told you secretly that any rigid complex which is non-degenerate is like that, but it, it's difficult to prove. It's, well, it's rather difficult to prove. Um, so I'm, I'm not, so somehow it's secretly known. Um, okay, now, as I explained to you, any, well, 
it turns out any two rigid utilizing complex are uniquely isomorphic in the derived category. The reason is Grothendieck told us that any two dualizing complexes are isomorphic up to shifting in degree and tensoring by line bundle. On each, let's assume the spectrum is connected. Now, this quadratic equation uh, gets rid of the, both these twists because the twisting by the line bundle, the line bundle with the rigidity says that the line bundle is an idempotent of the Picard group, so it's trivial, and likewise the shifting of some number n has to be an idempotent in the additive group of integers, so it has to be zero, so there is um, an isomorphism, and then you can adjust this isomorphism by multiplying by a unit to make it rigid, and then you're stuck, I mean you're finished. So any two are uniquely isomorphic in the rigid category. <coughs> okay, and, and it exists. Uh, existence is kind of, you, you somehow show that rigid structure can be pulled back under certain kinds of morphisms, and so you show existence, but of course, once you have uh, the structure, you don't care how you got there. Okay, now I want to refine things, and to refine it, we need uh, a, a suitable dimension function. So let me note that if the ring A is a field, so I'm allowing uh, finitely generated field extensions of the, of the base. Um, so if, if I'm in one of these fields, any dualizing complex has to be just a, a rank one vector space in a certain shift, and we call the shift by D, and we call it the rigid dimension of that field. Uh, now this number is very close to being transcendence degree. Uh, if your base is a field, then it's precisely transcendence degree. <coughs> of the extension. However, if your base is a ring, then it, it could be something else. For example, uh, a finite field has rigid dimension minus one over the integers. Um, so it's a little bit twisted. Um, now, uh, now, now let's go back to a ring. Um, every prime uh, ideal has a field associated to it, the residue field, and we define the dimension of the point of the prime to be the dimension of the field. In this way, we get an integer-valued function on the spectrum of A, and it's rather easy to check that it has, it's a dimension function. So if you have um, a primes, one sitting directly above another, then its dimension drops by exactly one. Um, so if you're over, over a, again, over, over a base field, then the dimension is exactly the curl dimension of the ring A mod P. But if you're over a ring, then there's a certain translation due to, um, you know, the arithmetic properties of the base ring. Now we have to talk, uh, I have to remind you what injective modules over a ring look like. So over our notarian commutative ring A, every injective is a sum of indecomposables, and every indecomposable, I will call it J of P, so it's well defined up to isomorphism, uh, is, is uh, in fact contains the residue field and the, the residue field sits kind of as, as it's called, the sockle. So for, for me, the sockle is, well, anyhow, it sits inside. And so that's how they're parameterized. However, the, the, these things are completely non-functorial. Um, now, now, what I want to talk about is the rigid residue complex uh, over A. So this is combining ideas of Cousin complexes from residues and duality from Gothendieck with this idea of rigidity. So what is a rigid residue complex? Uh, so it's a rigid complex as before, but this guy, K of A, is not just a dualizing complex as before, but it has a very particular shape. In degree minus I, it's a direct sum with multiplicity one of every injective in decomposable corresponding to a prime ideal of the dimension I. So, so this lives mostly in negative degrees over the integers it could have a little bit in degree plus one. Um, and um, it's a complex of injectives. Um, and, um, okay, so we have these guys. Um, how, how do you get one? So if you take a usual rigid complex and you apply Grothendieck's Cousin operation, which is a very complicated operation, uh, it actually extracts from you one of, these, one of these guys. So they exist. Whenever you have a rigid dualizing complex, these guys exist. But these are ultra-rigid in the following sense. So what is a, a morphism between one rigid uh, residue complex and the second? So, so phi is actually a homomorphism of complexes, something extremely simple-minded. In each degree of a homomorphism from the k to the k prime, and this homomorphism must commute with the differentials. The extra condition is that when we pass to the derived category, so we apply this functor q, now we have a morphism in the derived category, and here it has to satisfy 
the rigidity condition. So, so, so it's rather strange. The objects themselves are just direct sums of injectives and, and naive homomorphisms, calculated pointwise if you want, um, but the condition on them is in the derived category. Uh, you, you can't override the derived category, and you don't want to, but um, it's somehow separate, so you, you check two things separately. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. So it is in itself a rigid dualizing complex and a way to manufacture it. For example, suppose you have, you have a, a field K and a smooth algebra A of dimension N. You would take differential forms of top degree shifted by N. This comes equipped with a rigid structure, but of course it's not injective. But you take its minimal injective resolution. This is what the Kuzan operation does. And this will give you one of these guys. And since it's quasi-isomorphic to the original, it inherits a rigid structure. Well, you have from to endow your, it with from your work. Yeah, but you have to endow it with a rigid structure. It, it will have oh. many. Oh. And, but, yeah, what? but given any one, the, all the rest are parameterized by multiplying by invertible elements of the ring. Okay, so that chooses that sort of thing. So you, you, have, you, have, you, you can adjust it, but you then you fix it. Okay. For example, if you shift the complex, it will never have one. Um, okay, so we have such a category with these sorts of morphisms, extremely rigid sort of thing. Um, okay, so now th this has even more properties than just being unique, and these are the functorial properties. So existence I basically explained. You, you do the kind of coherent dualizing thing, and you take minimal injective resolution in a suitable sense. So the resolutions are not unique, but once you've thrown at the rigid structure, it's locked. Um, so there exists, it's unique and functorial properties. So the first one is uh, what happens if you have an etal, or essentially etal homomorphism. Turns out that these rigid residue complexes are as functorial as differential forms or differential operators or derivations um, with respect to etal homomorphisms. Um, and so um, what it looks like is the following. So A to B is a, a, an etal. Essentially etal means uh, you, you also localize. So it's not necessarily finitely generated. It's a little bit more general than etal. For example, passing from, from a, a, a ring to a, to a local ring is also essentially a tell. Um, so w in this situation, there is a covariant homomorphism from the rigid residue complex of A to that of B, um, which is unique if you write down the suitable um, rigidity equation. And it, it, of course, has the property, just like in differential forms, that this homomorphism induces um, an isomorphism when you tensor. Uh, and it's, it's functorial. And, and the way I'd like to interpret this, in fact, that's how we're going to use it in the Lean Mumford stacks, is that this, this really shows that the operation of assigning to a, a ring A its rigid residue complex is a sheaf on the, uh, on the small etal site of spec A, just like differential forms are. Basically, well, for a more complicated reason, but in the end, rather similar. Okay, now the second property is, is a kind of strange property, but should be familiar to somebody who read the, the innards of residues and duality. Um, and this is the following. So we consider any homomorphism of, of, of our rings. Uh, in this situation, there's a, a, a homomorphism which is contravariant, goes in the wrong direction, which l let us call a trace, but this does not respect the differentials in general. It only is a homomorphism of graded rings. Very strange, Ezra, yes. Um, it, it, it does respect the trace when the homomorphism is finite, and the residue theorem will say that once we shiftify everything, it will also respect the trace in the uh, proper situation, and that what is hidden here is a residue isomorphism. I will give an explicit ex example on the next slide. Uh, so let, let me call this the indrigid trace, because somehow on our tinian local rings it's a trace, and then we approximate by going to the limits. In going to the limit, we lose the... The, 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 the commuting with the differential property. Um, anyhow, um, so, so these two operations, the etal localization and the rigid traces, commute with each other. Um, so here's a, a very explicit example, the most simple-minded example you can have, which you know, has any, any, any flesh to it. Um, so we take uh, the, the affine line over an algebraically closed field. You can pretend it's the complex numbers, because then your residues can have the classical form. Of, of just integrals on paths. So, so let me write t for the parameter. 
Uh, and uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, tell you what the residue complex, the rigid residue complex of the string is, so on the, on the affine line, and then uh, try to, to, to calculate a trace and see what the problem is. So, so, so since uh, the prime ideals here live in degrees 0 and 1, it's, um, then the, the, the residue complex is in degrees 0 and minus 1, because we put minus. So in degree minus 1, as expected, we have 1 forms with values in the function field. So let's call them meromorphic differential forms. Uh, in degree 0, we have to have a, and if this is the injective hull, well, it is the, the, the function field. In degree 0, we'll have to go over the closed points, the maximal ideals, and for each one of them, exhibit an injective module corresponding to that uh, to that um, ideal, and the most convenient, the most canonical form for that is to take the um, continuous dual for the addict topology, M addict topologies, over the complete local ring. So it looks for the D module people as a delta distribution, the left D module, well, this will actually be the, this is the left D module. No, this is the right D module because it's dual of functions. It's the right D delta distribution supported at the point maximum ideal M and we take the direct sum. Um, now, now it, notice the complete local rings have this, this very nice uh, form, the power series ring. Of the what? Quran space. Quran space. What is it? This is, this is just, um, this, is, this is why it's called the residue complex, as we will see. Um, so now, uh, I have to tell you what is this uh, holomorphism, which of course is the sum of local components. So uh, what you have in each component M, you have to send a meromorphic one form, let's say alpha, to a functional uh, delta alpha on this, com on this complete local ring. And this we get from the residue pairing. So, so there's always a residue on the completion of M, added completion of this. If you want to be in the complex situation, you simply take, on, you take the point M, which is a point little z, and you do residue around that pole, pole of meromorphic forms, and you get some constant. So, um, so this is the residue, and, and it gives you a pairing by taking a locally a a holomorphic function times a meromorphic form, take the residue, and it gives you a constant. And it, it, it's, um, yeah, so that's, that's what it is. Uh, now I want to compare it. So I want to consider the holomorphism, the field goes into A, which is, of course, not finite. So we should run into trouble. Uh, so, so what is the residue complex of the base field? It's just the base field in degree zero. So here is our diagram of the end rigid trace. Um, so that's the vertical arrow. So this is from the previous slide. This is the rigid residue complex of the field, which really only sits here. This is nothing here, and this is nothing. And we're trying to compare to what extent this diagram fails to commute. Uh, so this means the, the trace fails to commute with the co-boundary operators. So, um, so, um, so what is the homomorphism here? Uh, it's the obvious thing. I mean, so here's the formula. I take in each sum end a functional, and I evaluate it on one. So I get a constant. That's very natural to do. And, and this is the formula here. And now, okay, so let's take a, a nasty uh, differential form, uh, dt over t, which has a simple pole at the origin. And we try to see what happens is, so it has no residues elsewhere, so everything is zero, with the exception of the um, origin, the maximal ideal generated by t, in which case its residue is one, and therefore if we go this way, we get the number one, that's what's written here, whereas this way we get the number zero, so there is a problem, and of course we know what is the problem. The problem is that at minus infinity, we should have taken a residue which will contribute minus one, and they would cancel out if we had the point at infinity which, okay, so that's the residue theorem that everybody learns in complex variables, functions of one complex variable. Um, okay, the other property that will be needed is, is a strange property called etal codescent, um, which looks like this. So suppose I have a homomorphism from a ring A to a ring B, which, uh, so let me call it faithfully etal, so it's faithfully flat plus a tau. In other words, on the spectra of a surjective a tau homomorphism. And now uh, the two projections correspond to two uh, injective, well, in two ring, that would be two injective ring homomorphisms from B into the tensor product. And the assertion is that the following sequence is exact. So remember the traces, they don't know from, um, 
they don't commute with the differential, so I have to work in each degree separately. So in degree i, we have a homomorphism trace of u. Here we have two traces, and the assertion is that this is exact. Now, this is very strange. I've never seen this in algebraic geometry before. Uh, maybe it's something one sees in uh, distributions in differential geometry. Certainly, it's very easy to check in case uh, a and b are finite over the base. Let me just explain how this happens by hand-waving. If, if k is a field and a is finite over it, then the rigid residue complex is a star, the linear dual of a. Okay? That's the correct formula, and, and the, the rigid trace is dual to the ring homomorphism. So now if a to b is essentially, a b to a, no, a to b is faithfully flat, then we have a to b to b tensor a b, which is an exact sequence of, of rings, right? That's the, um, um, sometimes people call that Mitsur complex, but that's the, the descent, and then you just take linear dual of everything, and, um, and you get this one. So just by linear algebra, this, you get the sequence um, in this situation, the general case, you basically do something like this on every Artinian local ring, and then, and then you patch it together. Uh, yes? Yeah, I don't know what goes beyond this. It's just the truncation here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the way to say it. Okay. Yes. Uh, second, um, what's, the relator, what's the relationship between these residualizing complexes, uh, <laughs> these residue complexes, and the, you know, the Adelic resolution? Uh, very different. So uh, I, I happened to um, write about it many years ago, so I, but I looked it up. So the, the, it's very different. So one should think of it as, as follows. So one should think of the, these Adels as an analog of distributions. And, and, and the Adels, so these are the residues, and the Adels should be thought of as analogs of the um, C infinity functions or the Dolbock resolution of functions. And, um, and, and so the Adels form a, a, a DG ring, mm -hmm. a very nice flask, which is analogous to, and this is also flask, it's in fact a sum of skyscraper sheets, and this is actually a, a module over the Adels. So the, the Adels act on this, and there's a particular element in the Adel which actually represents the differential here. The, the residue map. And so the adults are like functions and the rest, and this is like... Module over it, yes, yeah, yeah. And the module is the same as distributions? Yeah, and, and, well, analogously, for example, these guys um, are, uh, these guys are, are covariant for um, homomorphism, and, and if you want the differential, we'll say covariant for proper maps, and the adults are contravariant. So, and so one, if you add in the Durham theory, one of them calculates Durham homology and the other Durham cohomology. So, to some extent, this is the analogy. Okay, so now uh, we want to put all of this uh, on schemes, and, um, and uh, so you just glue. Oh, so let me explain how this happens. So, so, so X is a finite type scheme over the base, uh, and, okay, so, so, Every open set is one of the rings I considered before. Um, and uh, the important thing to notice is that if we have an inclusion of affine open sets, the corresponding ring, hom ring homomorphism is, is a tau. Uh, and this allows us to use, um, to use uh, the uh, a tau localization property. So a rigid residue complex on the scheme X is the following information. Now, since we're lazy or simple-minded or just careful, we don't do... Uh, DG things on globally. We just do DG things or all kinds of complicated things on affine open sets, which is going to explain why we don't have global squaring operations, just local squaring operations, and taking care that they at all localize properly. So, so a rigid residue complex uh, c first consists of a just a complex of quasi-coherent sheaves, which we'll be dualizing in the end, together with, so just on every affine open set in U, we want the restriction, so this is a complex over the ring corresponding to U, a rigidifying isomorphism there. So for every open set, we have a rigidifying isomorphism. And then we need some axioms to tie them together. So first of all, this complex is a rigid residue complex over this ring, just like before. And secondly, if we have an inclusion of open sets, which corresponds to an Atal ring homomorphism, the restriction homomorphism, we get to the inclusion relative to the rigid structure here and the rigid structure here, is the unique rigid localization permitted for this Atal ring homomorphism. 
So it's very difficult to have such a thing. Uh, on the other hand, when we have such things, we can glue them. Um, so the collection of all these guys are called the rigid structure, and um, a rigid morphism, again, is uh, just like in the affine case, a homomorphism between these, this quasi-coherent sheaf and this one that commutes with the differential, such that on every affine open set, the restriction of this homomorphism uh, respects the rigid structures. So the homomorphisms are global quasi-coherent. The checking is done separately on every affine open set. And uh, so we have a category like this, again, very rigid. And, um, and uh, the theorem, not difficult, says that every scheme has one and it is unique. How does one prove it? For every affine open set, you concoct this rigid residue complex. They could be very different from each other, but any two are uniquely isomorphic. And then on intersection, you have a unique isomorphism between the restrictions that respect the rigid structures. So you have gluing information in the most naive sense of sheaves, so each of the sheaves glue, and then also the differentials glue, and, 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 and then, again, uniqueness of morphisms is done similarly. So there is one. Just like you have one sheaf of differential P forms, you have one residue complex on each scheme. And again, the traces and etal localizations behave the same way. So uh, if you have, a, um, if you have um, a homomorphism between finite type schemes with no additional constraints, then there is this rigid, in-rigid trace, which is just a graded homomorphism of quasi-coherent sheaves. And, um, and it's functorial. And likewise, there is the localization and localization I didn't get to look, yeah, well, localization uh, commutes with these traces. So that's, the gluing here is very simple-minded once we have this extremely strong um, uh, rigidity. Um, now, um, what about residues and dualities? This is recovering uh, Grothendieck's results. Um, uh, but somehow, I, I mean, for people who didn't read this, um, mo the, the approach of, Gr of Grothendieck Hartshorn um, is using, so that somehow the theory there is also in a sense rigidified, but instead of this local naive formula that we had, rigid rigidification, I would say, is obtained by global duality on the whole category of schemes. So you have horrendously complicated diagrams to check, and in fact, Hartshorn just, just excused himself from checking it, but then uh, Lippmann and Conrad and other people verified that everything, after slight, you know, touching up, actually does commute and does make sense. Uh, there is the approach of Neyman, which uses representability, but th this is very different. And um, so even, so I personally like this approach. Um, of course, I'm, I'm somewhat biased. Um, so here's the residue theorem. So, so we have already, between any map of schemes, we have a rigid trace. We would like to know, just like in the projective line where we add the point of infinity that we have um, commuting with the, with the co-boundary. So the theorem says that whenever F is a proper map, um, this end rigid trace is a homomorphism of complexes. So this is called the residue theorem because, um, well, for example, in the one-dimensional case, it is actually sum of residues equals zero. Um, I actually like the proof here. Um, one of the reasons I didn't write this part of the paper before, um, in addition to other reasons, I still didn't know about the, pro the, the mistakes in it, is I didn't like the proof of the residue theorem. It was very messy and somehow non-conceptual. Um, I thought one could prove it using uh, Tate's methods of uh, you know, all kinds of soft, soft moves, maybe perverse sheaves. Things, these things are also perverse sheaves, uh, these residue complexes. But in the end, the solution that worked is actually using rigidity. So you see, so it's enough to reduce to the case of the projective line, not over a field, but over an Artinian local ring. That's rather easy reduction by the functoriality of things. But then how do you prove it for that case? So the thing is this. So you take, so X is our projective line over this Artinian ring A. You embed the projective line diagonally in X cross X. Now from this map, you observe what happens and use a Kunith generating Kunith spectral sequence to notice that this one, the first cohomology on X of, of one forms, which is a rank one, right, this is a projective line. It is a rank one A module. So the whole thing is to identify it canonically with A. That's the residue map. 
So from this diagonal embedding, this Rankine module comes equipped with a rigid structure that can be characterized by closed points, suitable one. And then once you have the correct rigid structure, there's exactly one isomorphism, one trivialization of it. And, and that's, that's what's hidden inside there. So this proof I like. <coughs> and, and then once you have this, the duality theorem, uh, following the same uh, kind of uh, yoga that, that Grothendieck has, uh, so whenever you have a proper map, uh, one easy way of stating the duality is if you have a, a, a complex in the finite part of X, you can either dualize it on X and then uh, apply the trace from here to here, or you first push it forward and then apply, so apply the duality here. And the map from here to here is the trace. Uh, so uh, what you would like uh, to have, this, this, is a, this is an isomorphism of the derived category, and it's the, the reduction steps, you know, like Chao Lemma and so on and so forth, um, uh, make it rather easy. So you're saying that the inrigid trace in the proper case can be corrected to be a morphism of complex? No, it is. It is. It is. It is. I don't, we don't have to do anything. No, no, it is. It is. So that's wonderfully true. Yeah. You said it was a perverse sheet. Yeah. I don't know. So, so, it, so, so it's a perverse coherent sheet. Okay, so one can uh, talk about T structures and, and uh, well, that's a different story, but it's a perverse coherent sheaf. And one can, for example, we discovered, Zhang and I, that you can glue dualizing complexes without this, I mean, these, these Kuzan complexes were introduced by Grothendieck to glue, because you cannot glue in, in triangulated categories, but if you have correct representatives, you can glue. What we know to Zhang and I is that any scheme has a perverse T, t structure on the, on the coherent category, in which the rigid dualizing complexes are sheaves, so you glue the T-structure, and then you glue, on using the T-structure, the perverse sheaves. But this is only important for non-commutative schemes. Here it's much easier to use this uh, injective resolution. Okay, so uh, now, okay, so this is uh, some um, uh, public relations, I already mentioned that. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so now I want to pass to, to Stacks. Uh, um, I see I'm, I'm going quick here, so that's good. Uh, now, you see, I made this paragraph here. I, unfortunately, I don't have time to give background <laughs> on Stacks. Now, in this course, uh, I mean, these are just classical Deline Mumford Stacks, finite type over a very nice commutative, you know, Noetherian regular ring. So, they're, you know, they're not higher stacks, they're not derived stacks, they're not even art in stacks. So, everybody knows exactly what they are, but still, maybe. Maybe intimately, we don't know them very well. So let me just say that the way I think about Adeline Mumford stack of this sort, and in fact, in the proof, I will actually use this point of view. It's kind of a reductionist point of view that Adeline Mumford stack is not very different from a scheme. It's, sort of, it's a scheme, but there's also a finite groupoid or many finite groupoids that s somehow connect, connect some of the points. And they kind of sit like, like parasites, like, you know, like fungus sitting on the thing and it does something. Um, and so that's, it turns out to be useful if you have a, a, a suitably nice coarse moduli space. And that's, that's the, the approach that I will use. Um, okay, so um, some references, yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, some people have tried to, to look at this. Uh, I, I, I have no idea what is the status of the work by Nironi. Uh, I didn't understand it. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I don't think, uh, with the exception of Nironi's preprint, that there's any, it's been any attempt of global duality. I, I don't think, for example, that, um, that Lurie has something like this. He does have a theory of dualizing complex in the affine case. Um, maybe, you know, in his volume number 20, <laughs> he will have, uh, and then probably we'll I cover... I whole series that he has 14 volumes. Ah, because I, I okay, because for example, I don't know how to handle art and stacks using my approach. Um, uh, okay, so, so I will only consider, uh, you know, Nocerian finite type, the Lee Mumford stacks over our nice base ring. Um, so I want first to say what are the rigid residue complexes and then try to state uh, the results. Um, so, so of course, the, the, the big difference is that we don't have uh, covers of our X by, by 
affine open subschemes, but rather the, the et al approximation of that, namely we have a, an affine scheme U with an et al map to the Deline Mumford stack. And uh, you know, sometimes it's surjective, and then we call it an atlas. <coughs> um, so, um, right, and, and to give a quasi coherent sheaf on, on X, it is necessary and sufficient to give on every such U a quasi coherent sheaf, namely a model over the ring of functions, uh, which is compatible with, um, with morphisms into X. So the pullbacks should be compatible. Uh, so that's, that's uh, what we're going to do in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to um, install a rigid residue complex on the stack. But first I have to show you what this is. So it's actually very similar to a scheme. So a rigid residue complex on our Deline Mumford stack is, first of all, a bounded complex of quasi-coherent sheaves uh, K adorned with this uh, Gothic X, together with a rigid structure. But unlike the previous case, the rigid structure is not parameterized by affine open sets, but rather by these guys. I don't know how to call them, patch, et, et, et al patches maybe, affine patches. Um, so, right, so we have a collection for, for of, of rigid isomorphisms for all of these uh, possible choices of, G, of U and G. Uh, specifically, for any such U and G, um, we can pull back our, our complex to get a quasi-coherent uh, sheaf on U and therefore a globally a, a complex of modules over the corresponding ring. This raw is a rigid isomorphism for that complex. So this pair is just like in the very beginning of the lecture, a rigid residue complex over this ring which itself is a finite type ring over the base. So that's what we want. And then we want some kind of interaction between them to make it um, sensible. And the interaction is as follows. Um, suppose we have a commutative diagram of follows. So U1 and U2 are these, uh, at these affine schemes. G1 and G2 are a tal maps into X. And this is a diagram. So I guess H also has to be a tal. Um, and, um, and the condition is that, so we, we have, oops, we have this way. We have uh, the, the rigid residue complex of X here. We can pull it here, we can pull it here, and we can pull it along here. Now, if we pull it here, then this guy has a rigid structure, this row number U1, G1. This one here has a rigid structure, row U2, G2, and, we, and this homomorphism uh, is an etal homomorphism, and we want this the thing coming from restriction to be the only, the unique rigid localization homomorphism that is compatible with these two rigid structures. So there's a, it's most one, and we want it to be that particular one. Now at this point, people ask me, but what is if this diagram is commutative up to homotopy? This is the first time this was asked by your friend in uh, uh, Vancouver. But nobody asks, I won't say. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's actually redundant, uh, right? Because y you see why? I think so. Okay, good. So that's the difference between uh, <laughs> since uh, higher categories, everybody know, knows all this stuff. So uh, <laughs> what? No, so I can't handle. I, I don't have. That's why I cannot handle uh, art and stacks. Uh, this rigid localization thing only it has a meaning for an etal, or at best, essentially etal. So maybe localization after an etal homorphism. Uh, so the differential forms cannot change. Otherwise, my formulas have no meaning. If I could put a meaning on this, I would possibly be able to do this game for art and stacks. But at this point, I cannot handle smooth of dimension more than zero. And you know, so and. Uh, it's really probably too difficult to do it using these, let's say, semi-pedestrian or semi-classical methods. Uh, even quasi-coherent sheaves on, on art and stacks are, are messy, and I think some of the original texts had mistakes. Uh, I think Olson had to rectify something in the French book in uh, Le Monde Moré Bay. So not to mention if I want to do residues and duality. So I, I'm, I don't, didn't even have, I, I'm, I don't want even want to start thinking about this right now. And pr presumably, the correct answer will somehow all fall from the bigger machinery. It, it, yeah, it might be really too difficult to do it, as I said, in the semi-classical or semi, you know. No, I, I will. I will. Sh I, the Talco descent will show up soon. Oh, uh, 
I can't state it, right? So, so because you see, it, I don't, I don't know how to state things even. So it, it's this discrepancy between the Atal site and the least Atal site. There are many. There's a, uh, actually there's a lot of action going on there, uh, which is it, it spared us when we do the, the, the just the Atal things, just the Lee Mumford. So it's a, it's a whole new ball game. Um, yeah, I have no idea what what to expect even. Um, okay, so as I indicated, uh, every every such Deline Mumford stack has a rigid residue complex, and it's unique up to unique rigid isomorphisms. So you just etal descent allows you to glue in each degree a quasi-coherent sheaf by by this thing, and and the the differential is also glue. And, and you get you get this existence. So this is rather simple-minded for you know for after you get used to this. Uh, secondly, um, if we have an arbitrary map of deline mumford stacks, uh, we have this indrigid trace on the push forwards, and this is done using the Atal co-descent. So it's very difficult. It's not likely that you can you know find simultaneously Atal F and atlases of this and this that's they're combinatorially suitable, um, and so you just give up on it and you you do something more which is more flexible somehow. And this Atal descent co-descent allows you um, to um, to compare um, you know to, to well to do it. Um, so so now once we have this rather nice analogs of, of the scheme theoretical situation, one could ask whether, the residues, whether we have residues and duality in this context. And the answer is uh, maybe. Uh, so let me, let me explain uh, the technical conditions that I use, and, and you know, it's subjective to judge how general this is or not. Presumably one can remove this if we understand enough the local structure of um, well, some of the structure of um, algebraic spaces, which unfortunately uh, is not written up, and yeah, I mean, somehow one has to take Knudsen's book and write another chapter, perhaps. Um, so I'm going to use the Kiel-Mori theorem regarding a coarse moduli space. So what, what this theorem says, and it's beautifully written in Olson's book that should come out soon, I hope, um, is the following. So suppose X is, is, is separated over the base. Um, then it has a coarse moduli space. Now, what's a coarse moduli space? It's, it's really, it mimics what in, in, in old moduli problem was the coarse moduli space of the, of the functor and, and, and of which the stack is a better approximation. But uh, abstractly, it goes like this. So it's a morphism from our stack to X, but X is a, an algebraic space. And it has a universal property uh, regarding morphisms into algebraic spaces, plus some normalization regarding the, the geometric fibers. Um, so let me call our Deline Mumford stack coarsely schematic if it, this X, which is uniquely defined, it's canonical, if this X is a scheme, not, not an algebraic space, but actually a scheme. Uh, so this is kind of restrictive because, for instance, if X is a genuine Deline, a genuine algebraic space, not a scheme, it is its own coarse moduli space, so it fails this criterion. On the other hand, um, uh, apparently this is not such a bad condition in practice. So this is my technical assumption that could be, again, removed if we understand enough uh, just solving the case of an algebraic space. Um, okay, now I want to have a relative version of this. So suppose I have a morphism uh, of stacks F, and I assume that the morphism is separated, so, so we have, of course, um, well, so you will see. Um, um, so um, I call this morphism coarsely schematic if there exists some atlas V to Y, so some surjective et al. map, such that the stack that we get by base change, so now uh, it, it, is, it, it is a separate stack over V and therefore over the base, uh, is coarsely schematic. So its coarse moduli space a la uh, that we know exists is actually a scheme. So this condition is kind of strange, and it's actually sensitive to the uh, et al. atlas V. So if Y is coarsely schematic as evidenced by a certain affine atlas V, another atlas V prime might fail to satisfy it. Now this was, I didn't understand the example, but th this is something that, uh, what's the name? Um, I forget his name. <laughs> um, uh, so you can, there, there exist 
an algebraic space over a field K which is not algebraically closed, such that when you um, base change to a finite separable extension, Janusz Kolar uh, came up with this. So you change from K to K prime, which is a finite separable field extension, the base change of the algebraic space is actually a scheme. So it has to do with singularity theory. I, I didn't understand it. So this is a strange sensitive condition. Um, so the residue theorem goes like this now. So suppose X is a morphism of Deline Mumford stacks. I'll, I'll finish really soon in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, but I, I know my time is up. Um, uh, so suppose I have a, a proper a morphism of Deline Mumford stacks, which has this, this, uh, this uh, um, coarsely schematic property. In this case, we have that the, the trace, the, the indrigid trace, so this is supposed to be indrigid, is actually a homomorphism of, uh, of, of uh, complexes. Um, okay, so, so now, so now let's consider duality theory, now that we have the residue theory. So, so do we expect to have global duality and um, this is something that, that I found, well, I didn't understand the Lean Mumford stacks until a year ago or so, or two years ago. Um, so I read this blog of, of Johan de Jong on the internet, and he gives an example of a finite group in characteristic P whose classifying space has this problem that it doesn't satisfy global duality because of infinite cohomological dimension. And this turns out to be a big problem, but a genuine problem in, in all of um, stack theory and characteristic zero. Um, and uh, in order to somehow ameliorate this, um, just several years ago, this is Abramov, uh, Dan, Dan, um, Dan Abramovich, also in Vistoli, introduced the concept of a, a tame stack. So the stack is called tame if, well, w one way of saying it is, so we, we, take, uh, we take some geometric point of our base ring, and then the corresponding groupoid, let's call it K prime, X of K prime is now a finite groupoid, and you want the automorphism groups occurring them to have orders prime to the characteristic of that algebraically closed field. So some of the geometry and the group theory are somehow transversal to each other. So this we also ca can, make, uh, can make relative. So a tame map between stacks is such that for a suitable affine atlas, V to Y, uh, the corresponding base chain stack is, is uh, tame. This is not sensitive to, this is independent of the resolution to be calculated in other words, in other ways. And the duality theorem says that if all three conditions hold, if F is a proper tame coarsely schematic map between the lean Mumford stacks, then uh, the indrigid trace actually induces duality in the formal, formula that I gave in the scheme case. Um, so, I, I don't know, can I take two more minutes to sketch the proof? Or, uh, There's a problem with the timing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so the, the rest is a sketch of proof and everything is on the notes, um, so you can amuse yourself by trying to, or to solve it without looking. <laughs>